Is this working? Because you didn't use it. Yeah, it is. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, my name is Besme. My supervisor is here, is Dr. Abir, Dr. Paul and Dr. Hilal Tunaydi. Today I'm going to talk about a data analytic approach for genetic smart car and the latest progression of type 2 diabetes. I will cover the introduction and the background of type 2 diabetes and the genetic structure, the current work, what I have done so far with the data, and what is our research aims. Before I start this uh, presentation, basically it, uh, diabetes, it, uh, there is um, a lot of type of diabetes. There is type 1 and type 2 diabetes and there is as well the another types. And um, um, we are focusing on type 2 diabetes in this research because it's 90% of all cases of diabetes are uh, developed type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a chronic disease and it uh, starts or resulted from when the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin or the when the insulin doesn't uh, interact with the body cell in an effective way. So basically, if you look to this diagram here, they will show you that the muscle unable to use the glucose because of the insulin um, resistance. And this is will cause the level of glucose in your body will increase. And this is what, what, what is causing type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes basically can be developed at any age, but it's more common when you are at the age of 40. And uh, recently, it start to be appear as well with the children. So it is a very serious complication a problem, and it's now uh, uh, it's responsible about lots of complications, which is uh, stroke, blindness, cardiovascular disease that including giant heart attack, and as well um, is responsible about kidney failure and lower limb amputation. So it is really serious a problem and it has a lot of impact on the people. Uh, nowadays, it's type 2 diabetes. It's being recognized as a worldwide epidemic. It's everywhere. And according to um, Diabetes UK, the number of people who are suffering from diabetes is 3.9 million. And 90% of them, as I said before, are, are uh, suffering from type 2. And um, beyond the human suffering, we can see there is a direct and indirect cause to the MHS. And it is 8.8 .8 <coughs> billion, um, and it's predicted to be higher in the future uh, years, as well as an indirect cause, uh, which is 13 billion, and it is as well estimated to be higher in the coming year. The direct cause will include maybe the um, um, complication, treatment, diagnose, the indirect cause will cover uh, the sickness, mortality, as well as the informal care when, for example, when people, they keep working and at the same time, because of they have got this condition, their productivity will go low. So this is will cause a lot of um, money to the NHS. As I said before, it's a very complex disease and it's associated with several factors, uh, particularly genetics particularly uh, genetics and genetics it become a key component of the risk of this di uh, of this uh, condition family history as well is a play a very big role as the individual with a positive family history is uh, two to three times more 
and uh, uh, like so serology to develop type 2 diabetes than people who they have got um, negative family history. Environment is playing a big role as well as when people are of overweight or obese, they uh, are more uh, able to develop type 2 diabetes. And there is uh, some people believe like when you eat lots of sugar, you will develop diabetes. This is not a true. The thing is when you are when you eat lots of sugar, you will be overweight. And you, when you are overweight, you will develop these disease. Physical inactivity as well playing a, a big thing with this thing as when you do exercise, you will control your weight and uh, you will improve the um, uh, glucose and the lipid metabolism in your body. So these, all these risk factor is very important to be considered in our uh, study. As I said before, genetics is a, v is a key component in um, developing this disease. So in order to understand the etiology of type 2 diabetes, we need really to understand the DNA structure of our body. And basically we all know we have got a thousand maybe million of cells in our body and each cell has got 23 pairs of a chromosome and this a chromosome has got, it consists of a very long string of strand of DNA and it's all coiled up uh, like a ball and this ball, it's, um, uh, if you look to this ball you will see there is a coding and non-coding uh, blocks and in this, the coding blocks, it's called the gene and if you look to the gene there is these uh, small things which is called the nucleotide, which are uh, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. These are and our interest in this uh, uh, research, as if any changes happen in this uh, nucleotide, will be uh, causing um, um, any type of disease. Basically, as I said, it's the DNA is consists of a long string of these num of these letters. And here, if we see, there is uh, it's all the same. It's similar. Just this position, it's little bit um, different. So this is what is called the SNP, and the SNP basically is a single base pair that is uh, changing in the genetic code, and it's the main cause of the genetic variation. That's why we all in this room, we don't look the same, we don't have the same eye color, we don't have the same height, the same weight. We all look different, and it's all because of this SNP. And basically, this, this SNP, it's fine because it's just making you feel different in, in, in a way of how you look. But sometimes if this SNP could cause uh, the faulty protein in the cell, this is what is caused the, um, um, the, the condition, for example, type 2 diabetes. And basically, as I said, it's 99.9% um, of these bases in whole, uh, uh, in whole the genome are remarkably similar. This is the only 0.1% uh, is the difference this is between us, and this is what makes the people uh, the person unique. In the current work, um, basically in this research, we are using a case control data set and it comes from Welcome Trust Case Control Consortium and it uh, uh, includes 2,000 cases and 1,500 uh, controls. And it's basically the information there, it's about individual and their genotype. The wrong <laughs> yeah. um, this data set that we have got, it's a big data, and basically, as you, you all know, the big data, it will be subjected to experimental error, and the experimental error, in our case, it will be low DNA quality, or maybe differences in the DNA quality that cause differences in the frequency of the genotype correlate, and all these errors could cause bias to the our study. So when this bias is appear, it will increase the false positive and false negative. And basically what I have done so far with this data is to get rid of all these um, um, like errors that introduce bias to the study. Um, and uh, we are using the blink and our tools to, uh, to conduct a quality control. And um, these things, it start with the um, uh, sample quality control and then in the later uh, a slide, it will be about marker quality control. With the sample quality control, basically, we need to delete individual that they have got like these errors. And one of these errors is basically is the uh, discordant sec uh, sex information. And this is basically, we are looking to the genotype of X chromosome. 
and if there is a flag, if there is a problem in flag, guys, we will remove this uh, sample. With the miscellaneous notag, we are looking for a sample or individual who they have got lots of missing SNP in their uh, EG notag. So we need to remove this sample. Uh, with the uh, as well as this, we don't want any duplicate and related sample in our data set, so we need to remove them. Um, here, uh, it's this is related to their marker quality control, and it's basically we will remove all the allele that they have got low frequency in the population, and we will conduct hard ribbon band aquarium, uh, which is test for the population stability in allele and genotype frequency, and we will as well remove anything that is um, match with this criteria. Um, in this research, we are aiming to investigate a SNP and we investigate a group of the SNP and how this is going to affect type 2 diabetes. As well as this, we will do a gene-gene interaction. We will investigate this and see how this will um, uh, a predict of type 2 diabetes. And we will consider a non-genetic risk factor, which is include environment, environment so, um, socio-demographic. And we are going to achieve all these things using bioinformatic and the niche. And in the future, we will use machine learning algorithm to achieve these aims. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Basically, we remove duplicate or uh, related um, individual because if you keep them in the study, they will be overrepresented. And basically, if this is happened, their genotype, for example, if this genotype it's been represented too many times and it's all be related to one family, uh, we will say at the end this is not it's associated to specific disease, and we don't want this because they have got the same genotype, so we uh, it's it's not going to be represented in the right way. So this is will cause bias to the study. Link basically it's a um, whole genome association uh, tool set and it helps to analyze genetics and as well as this it will help as I said it will help to um, conduct the quality control they have got lots of um, facility and tools to help us to conduct each these step that I mentioned.
Good afternoon. My name is Rukail Dahan, and my supervisors are Professor Key, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Kathir. Our topic is context-aware cloud-based access control for the Internet of Things. As is obvious from the title of the project, we, uh, our uh, aim is uh, to form a spontaneous collision between the Internet of Things and the cloud computing where the Internet of Things provides context-aware, accurate, dynamic context-aware information to a cloud, and uh, which is, in turn, uh, use them to uh, improve decision-making, to access to its resources. So we intend to offer a novel model for dynamic access to cloud resources in response to relevant context information, as well as allowing users to delegate their resources to others. I'll briefly describe what's the uh, challenge, some related uh, studies that have been done, why is it important, and finally, I will still summarize some idea. A before um, elaborating, start elaborating the uh, topics and the related challenge, we uh, just let's imagine the uh, a huge impact on children when they watch inappropriate programs that, uh, and it becomes easy these days uh, because uh, the digital uh, content are uh, spread out on, uh, in the era of the cloud. So how can we manage this problem? In recent year, there are uh, two different technologies uh, they are vital for our uh, life. The first one is cloud computing. The second one, which is tightly coupled with the uh, cloud computing, is the Internet of Things. To provide, and the day these uh, two technologies have some merits and shortcomings. To provide a universal environment, the combination of, integra uh, of uh, cloud computing and the Internet of Things uh, can enhance access control. So the key point here, Internet of Things provi produce rich context information and the cloud effectively serves as the brain to provide decision making based on the uh, uh, information that is provided from the Internet of Things. So the, uh, we will enhance the access control. The access control is one of a critical mechanism for data protection, which is responsible for managing users' access rights. And the, uh, um, because the high sensitivity of data that is stored on the cloud, uh, the cloud requires to achieve fine access control, and we can uh, achieve that by using attribute-based access control. The attribute can be classified into two types, uh, temporal and non-temporal attributes. Uh, from analyzing we uh, uh, from analyzing the existing uh, uh, access control scheme we found uh, that each access control scheme has a crucial requirements the first important one is user revocation that when the uh, after the user uh, will be has been revoked from the system the, uh, he will no longer be to able to access to uh, cloud resources the most, uh, the uh, second one is how can I build secure system uh, with uh, low cost uh, cost computation. The last one is dynamic adaptation scheme, and we intend to achieve that by using context information because the, uh, it's uh, dynamic in nature, and we can gather uh, the uh, context information from uh, the Internet of Things. The context awareness can be defined as any information that can be used to characterize the situation of entity. And the use of context awareness is a crucial and ubiquitous computing application. As my knowledge, the use of uh, context awareness is limited and that targeted at uh, detecting devices and network uh, environments. This, uh, some existing access control schemes that can be classified into two types. 
depends on uh, the uh, types of attributes. Some of them use non-temporal attributes and other use temporal attributes. For example, the first one couldn't handle a revocation problem. What's the challenge? The challenge is how can I build the uh, access control system by using both temporal and non-temporal attributes. And this is important because, for example, new employees in uh, a company and uh, have initial access right to access to specific data. And after that, they are permitted to join another group in the same company. That and there is a need to access more sensitive data under uh, limited condition and uh, during a specific uh, period. So this, uh, the using temporal and non-temporal is important. Also, we intend to develop active access control to uh, enable a dynamic adaptation scheme, as well as activating delegation property. Why is it important? If we uh, return to the previous example about children, we can imagine the uh, same problem with our solution. So the situation will be shown as uh, these pictures. The child can access digital content if uh, and only if they there's, uh, there's a combined, they, they are combi combined by uh, the adults or they, uh, they watch programs that are suitable for them. What we intend to do to solve this problem, um, first of all, we are analyzing the existing scheme and based on the analysis, we will, uh, uh, the uh, essential requirement will be extracted. The most important base is framework design. And um, this base uh, can be um, divided into two stage. The first one, design initial access control scheme, and we will solve the revocation problem. The second one, collecting data, designing active access control, and uh, activating uh, delegation property. The final phase will be uh, implementation and evaluation, and the uh, problem about children that I have, uh, that I mentioned, uh, will be test to be a case, a case study. To summarize, uh, we've covered the main issues of existing models. And we are uh, we will um, uh, uh, generate an active access control by integration uh, of Internet of Things and cloud computing. Also, the uh, system will eff efficiently solve the revocation problem and delegation capabilities. These are our references, and uh, thank you for your attention. to solve the problem about children and uh, uh, I intend to carry out the uh, access, poli access control policy as described in uh, the rating system. So we will uh, perform a rating system on the digital content. So you have to do it globally? Yes.
thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Ben Harris. I'm a first year PhD student from the Department of Computer Science. My supervisory team consists of uh, Dr. Chelsea Dobbins, Professor Stephen Fairclough, and Professor Carol Lisboa. And today, I'll be talking to you about utilizing recommender systems in a physiological application. <coughs> so my presentation is just going to contain a quick summary of the background literature, followed by a use case scenario, framework design, the research rationale, challenges, and then a conclusion. So my background consists of quick summaries of physiological computing, recommender systems, and machine learning. So what is physiological computing? It's a term concerned with innovating traditional human computer interaction. It marks a shift from using human input in the form of keyboard and mouse to using physiological signals such as brain activity, heart rate, uh, skin activity, amongst many others. And within this research field, context has been cited as an important element. It has allowed these systems to become adaptive and to also deliver a more personalized line of service. Additionally, it has allowed physiological systems to resolve the ambiguity within data sets. So for example, consider a data set, data set showing a high heart rate. We can use contextual data in the form of uh, accelerometer, data taken from a smartphone to conclude the origins of a high heart rate. So, uh, Assume that the coordinates show the person's been stationary for a prolonged period of time. From this, we can confidently conclude that the high heart rate is a source of stress. On the other hand, uh, assume that the coordinates show the person has been physically active for a long period of time. We can confirm that the high heart rate is not a symptom of stress, but of physical exercise. An advancement of sensor technologies has seen a development of new modes of interaction. Included in this is uh, brain-computer interfaces, augmentative communication, effective interfaces, silent speech, and uh, gesture-based interactions, uh, amongst many other examples. I'm quickly going to summarize recommend systems. These are a branch of personalization systems that attempt to help users find the right information. So online platforms, such as Amazon and eBay, use these algorithms to um, recommend services, items, and other products to users based on variables such as purchase history, pages they may have visited, or items they may have clicked on. And a lot like physiological systems, this research area has benefited from the implementation of context. And so much so, uh, it's seen a development of the context aware recommender system research field. And this can be categorized into three different paradigms. Firstly, we have uh, contextual pre filtering, which involves the placement of a contextual data before the use of a recommender algorithm, contextual post-filtering, which is contextual data placed after the use of a recommender algorithm, and then finally, uh, contextual modeling, which places contextual data actually within side the recommender algorithm. And I'm sure we've all been on Amazon before and seen pages uh, similar to that one. And I'm gonna, gonna quickly summarize machine learning, uh, a concept we're all familiar with, I assume. Um, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence and, and enables uh, systems to learn from data in an iterative manner. Uh, in the context of physiological systems, behavior and body responses to stresses can be used as features within models. And from the literature that I've surveyed, uh, dynamic Bayesian networks and Markov models seem to be the most commonly applied methods. So uh, in university life, we all encounter stress on a daily basis. And for that reason, uh, my work proposes the implementation of a smartphone application that will work as a stress combatant tool to help students and potentially staff alleviate the symptoms of stress. And within this approach, we hope to implement a recommender system that will be used to suggest effective coping strategies to help end users alleviate these symptoms. So uh, the following slide contains my uh, architecture of the proposed system. Uh, it will requ require a user to wear a wearable technology in the form of a Microsoft band, and this will be accompanied by a commercially available smartphone. And this di uh, dyad will be used to make inferences of both acute and chronic stress using various data sources, uh, included uh, locational data taken from the built-in GPS of the smartphone, uh, physiological data, uh, specifically heart rate and electrical dermal activity taken from the uh, built-in sensor of the Microsoft band, alongside uh, data taken from the built-in calendar application to find the current activity of the user, if possible, along with temporal context. This data uh, will then be aggregated for the purpose of applying a machine learning algorithm. Following this, upon an inference of stress, we will apply a recommender algorithm, which will create a user profile for the purpose 
of uh, suggesting a cosmic strategy. And we expect these to come in the form of recommendations such as uh, physical exercise, the suggestion to communicate with friends, colleagues, or family, and also uh, medita meditative uh, therapy. So this will include examples of like uh, mindfulness and other forms of therapy. Yeah. So why am I doing this research? As pre previously mentioned, stress is an important issue that cannot be overlooked. And I also mentioned on the previous slide that I'm looking to identify two types of stress. Uh, firstly, acute stress. This can be defined as the physiological response to the demands of the recent past and pressures of the immediate future. And common symptoms of acute stress include a elevated heart rate or elevated blood pressure. On the other hand, I'll be looking to identify chronic stress, uh, which is a lot more severe. And this can be defined as the emotional response to or the response to emotional pressure that occurs over a prolonged period of time. Symptoms of chronic stress include a person's inability to sleep, concentrate, and it can also contribute to memory loss. So failure to manage these chronic diseases can lead to the development of stress-related diseases and disorders. Included in this um, is a coronary heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. And to put this into context uh, for students, uh, failure to manage these cognitive symptoms may negatively impact their academic performance. And additionally, we hope that the utilization of this smartphone application will educate the users on how their mood can be reflective of their stressful states. So what are the challenges involved in my research? Um, I feel that the main issue is of applicability. Traditional recommended systems use static data in the form of, as previously mentioned, uh, purchase history, items viewed, and uh, clicked on a exam exam few examples, whereas we'll be using dynamic data in the form of uh, physiological signals. We feel that this will increase the difficulty of making accurate inferences, and it will also increase the likelihood of false positives occurring. In addition to this, uh, we hope for our application to operate in a convert manner. So we hope to extract the contextual and physiological data in an implicit way. Failure to do this, and if we manage to disturb the user in their natural environment, may lead them to be stressed. So we don't want our application to be counterproductive. And the final issue is our recommendation diversity. This is an issue that has been raised in the general recommender system uh, research field, and it's concerned with the repetition of recommendations. I feel that it applies to my research as we hope to uh, suggest a diverse range of coping strategies for the end users. Uh, so to conclude, uh, utilizing the recommending methods within physiological systems marks a shift from traditional practice of monitoring and relaying vital signs to a concept that seeks to actively enhance an individual's experience in the moment. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we see a change in how recommending systems typically function, and this is exemplified by the transition from working with static data uh, to utilizing dynamic data. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, and I welcome any questions. We don't take in uh, dietary information because that require more input on the user's behalf. And the goal of our system is to, you know, uh, require less effort on behalf of the user. We, I, I guess, we could use um, weather information. I'm not too sure for what purpose, but we could use the built-in web application of a smartphone. I guess that could add a different dynamic to our system. You know, something to consider. I guess. Yeah, it's true. Um, what, what I meant by that is we don't want the, uh, it's, it's more to do with like the false positives. We don't want the system to, for, for a false positive to occur, it would mean that the stress, the person isn't stressed. So it would make the person move to a stressful state when they weren't originally. So it goes against what we're trying to achieve. Oh, basically, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 
I guess that's an extreme example, but I do take your point. I mean, yeah, though, no, I guess we could use the built-in uh, calendar application to, f to find out when the person has the, if, if people use their calendar application to put their lines, and it would know, and it would suggest something uh, re appropriate for that circumstance, I guess. through the Microsoft band? Oh, well, we, we plan to um, start experimenting with subjects in September when students come back from the holidays. And we were using that um, data to train the model offline. And then I think we'll probably have a second round of uh, testing where we'll actually have a model to test on the participants. Yeah, I guess my use of uh, recommender systems is perhaps a bit different from what online platforms such as Amazon and eBay. I mean, an example would be, say you're stressed, a uh, system detects you're stressed, we could use temporal context to see that you're situated near a gym. That would be an appropriate recommendation based on someone being stressed. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know if I've misunderstood your question. No. no. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, where? Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'll, I'll some to consider, I guess. Yeah. The hardware itself? Uh, no, that's not something we're looking at at the moment. We're more just concerned with the software side of things and the creation of the application. Uh, no, I, I'm aware of what Sensor City is, yeah, but no. Uh, possibly, yeah, it's something I could look to in the future, I guess. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you.
Ja. Hello to everybody. Okay, let's talk about like an overview about my PhD. My PhD is about graphical, probabilistic graphical models are based in Bayesian networks, are applied to public health data, and we have two main problems, uh, three main problems. One of them is a structure finding problem that is based on for unknown data, how to build the graph. Other problem is time, time longitudinal data. That is when our data depends of the time. We have several years and we want to build a graph that implies uh, different, different times. For to solve that, we want to use dynamic Bayesian networks. And the last problem of the PSD should be um, causal reasoning. That means we find out uh, the graph that implies analysis of maps. That means that two variables are related, but that doesn't mean that that relation is a causal relation. So we need to, to tackle that problem with make some assumptions to find causal relations between that graph. The background of the data. We want to use an open data that are public health profiles. That data is provided by the UK government. And that data is a picture about the main indicators of the public health in the country. That indicators can be, or should be uh, uh, proxies, uh, percentage ratios, about the, the key points of the public health, like for example, deprivation, cancer, alcoholism, obesity, crime, child poverty. Exists a lot of, well, a lot of, no, it's about 20, 30 indicators and are measured in local authorities. Local authorities can be a city or a region about the UK, and in total there are 324 authorities, local authorities. With that data, we want to build a Bayesian network. That is a picture in the next slide I amplify to, to take a, a look about the, the nodes, but a uh, Bayesian network, it's a graph that relates the nodes with other nodes by edge. That edge, in case of um, in case of Bayesian networks, are directed and, add, and are acyclic directed graphs. So when you construct the, the graph or of the of the data, you can ob obtain a lot of information and independent maps. For example, if there is no edge between some nodes, that means that that nodes are independent. And we can obtain the, the joint probability just taking into account the node and the probability of the of the of, of, of his parents. In that case, that the node becomes isolated in all the data. For example, here we can see that uh, th there is some node that has some some children. If both, n if for example, if some node has a, a common parents that parents a priori, for example, are, in the are independent. But if we observe that node, that two nodes become dependent. That is a B structure that are very important in the graphs. There is other structures, for example, that here, that node, for example, has a, a common parent that is, that is not there. Uh, a priori, that nodes are dependent because has a common parent. If we observe that his parents, that nodes become independent. So there is a lot of information inside the graph that we can use to extract, extract uh, uh, useful information about the probabilities. The motivation of that graphs in average is help government decisions. 
that in, in general is improve the public health more efficiently. For example, which relation there are between indicators or where should government funds go or pre uh, predict local trends. That is important because it's not the same to make an inference in the average of the country that uh, make an inference, a local inference in some local authority. For example, it's useful to anticipate the scenarios or validate er model errors for unknown data because our data a priori is unknown. Our ongoing research now is in structure finding problem. We are using the PC algorithm to, to build the skeleton. Once we, we have the skeleton, we can orient the graphs to, to build the, the DAG. The DAG is the Bayesian network. The problem that we have is that the depending of the order of the nodes, we obtain a different DAGs. That is strange because you have unknown data and if you swap the variables, is, it, that means swap the columns, you should obtain the same graph, but in really it happens, it not happens. One of the proposed solutions are pre-order the nodes by mutual information. It's measuring the strength of the relation between some node and another. There is two kind of options. For example, we are using the, the strongest first node to build a skeleton. It's like a tree, if you want to build the graph, start building the, the nodes that has that have the, the higher mutual information, is the, the big branch. And then in the second step, when we want to prune the graph, we uh, start by the weakest node first. I mean, it's start to cut some edge by the weakest. If we do that, we can obtain a unique DAG per sample. That unique DAG is an average uh, good DAG. We measure the is it's good or not using the, the, the BIC score. That means the log likelihood plus some term that penalize the complexity of the, of the, of the graph. Once you have the, the strongest first, for example, is situated here. If you compare, for example, the, the best of 100 random samples, obviously the, it's best the, when you repeat 100 times random ordering, but that implies a high cost computation risk. Here we, we have the worst case, and the strongest first is in the middle, uh, tending fr from a good scoring. One solution is to obtain the strongest first, a reference, and compute several random orderings, and then select the best. Next challenge should be validate the robust DAG creation. Other uh, point that commented before is include the time dependency on, on in the graphs. That means that nodes at time t depends of nodes and time t minus one. To solve that, you use the dynamic Bayesian networks. One special model is two time slice Bayesian networks. Other problem is feasibility of causal reasoning. That is to convert the association maps in causal models. The causality implies a strong assumption and it's difficult to prove the causality when you base are based only in data information. Other option should be uh, use the expert knowledge, but or, or um, we are trying to, to prove that without expert knowledge. And that's more or less all the PhD are focused in two parts. One of them is theoretical, that is develop uh, probability gr graphical models framework. And the second part is practical, is implement that models in public health data. To use that models, we need first to validate in benchmark data. Benchmark data means that we know the solution and we test we error are, are pr producing with that models. And once we have validated the errors, we can use public health data. So there is a long journey, but results are promising. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, the BIC 
measures the dimension of the graph. That means that if we build a, a graph with a lot of nodes, obviously that node that, that uh, with so many edges probably represents better the log likelihood. But we are not interested in a, in a graph fully connected. For that reason, we introduce uh, that BIC term that penalize with the dimension. If the dimension of the graph, that means if, if there is too many edges, edge, that means uh, the score is negative. So we try to, to look for the trade-off between the log likelihood and the dimension of the graph. Okay, here is the, the best by random selecting. Here is the strongest first. Here is the poli sci with the weakest first. And here is the, the worst of random orders. We are focused on the strongest first. That is, and here is the, the, the idea situation is that, but implies a high cost computationally. I mean, we, we need to repeat 100 times every sample to find out which is the best uh, DAF. So, our exactly, our idea is use the strongest first and then uh, repeat a few times to, to try to find out if, if by the few times that we, we repeat the DAF, we obtain better than the strongest first. But our main target is start at minimum, uh, at the, st uh, the strongest first, and then try to improve by by random ordering. I mean, a best graph is that the BIC score is is that are negative numbers. So we want to uh, the highest BIC score, and a BIC score represents that that graph. Uh, represents better the data, the probabilistic relations in between the data. So a better BIC score mean is means that the graph is simpler and the we have a good log, li log likelihood that represents quite good the probability of the data. Yeah. Can you the PC algorithm is based on on testing uh, conditional independence. It builds starts with a, a, a graph fully connected, and then it starts to test um, five ways uh, uh, co conditional independence. So if if you test, for example, two nodes and are in, uh, uh, pass the 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 conditional independent test you can cut that, that edge. So you start to with fully connected graph and start with testing mutual uh, conditional independence every node. And at the end, you should cut every node that are independent. The first uh, test are um, marginal independent test, but the second steps to uh, start to introduce conditional independence. I mean, you select, for example, you select that node and that node, for example, but you add other conditional nodes, and if you select, if, if you find out that some nodes are conditional independent, that means you can establish some disseparation sets that can isolate the graph in several uh, independence maps. So, in the in, in overall, the PC algorithm is just to to test uh, conditional independence.
Good afternoon, everyone. If I may have your attention. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome to session two, the uh, second part of this, uh, this session for presentation from the computing and the mathematical um, department. So our first uh, presenter will be Carl Schaumer. He'll be speaking about facilitating active task monitoring using smart devices. Carl. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm just going to give you a sort of overview of the research um, we've been undertaking for the last sort of 12 um, months. Um, I'll just give you part one, basically, as a general background for our research, which will sort of discuss the literature sort of review and some of the limitations that we found in the, in the initial data set which we obtained and how we've um, overcome that to address that to overcome the problems. So, one of the key things for our research um, was to be able to accurately remote, um, remote remote patient monitoring to aid independent living. We really wanted to um, have a look how people live and see whether we could spot alterations in people's routines in order to facilitate independent living for people with likes of dementia and sort of mental health problems. Um, to facilitate early intervention practice, a lot of the times in the NHS, a lot of the costs associated with the NHS is not being able to intervene early on with people's problems. This directly results in increased costs and increases in um, hospital admissions. So our system, the idea was behind it was to see whether we could identify early on through deviations in people's routines to see whether we could trigger intervention much earlier on. And the method we were going to use basically to do this was to use data, classif uh, data classification, uh, classification techniques um, to identify the health conditions and the patient's well-being. So in order to do this, we were trying to think basically how to keep the costs down to the NHS, like all organisations are very cash-strapped, um, like ourselves. Um, so we wanted to use sensors essentially that didn't require ongoing maintenance on the side of the NHS and weren't intrusive to the patients. A lot of um, background sensors you, you see in, in literature, um, they're very intrusive, like having full sensors um, fitting cameras to a patient's property, and that has a massive overhead and ongoing cost for the NHS. So to address this, we looked at the idea of integrating with people's um, electricity meters. I'll talk a little bit more about these individually, but basically, they're a fundamental component of the smart grid, and they allow automatic data collection of people's energy routines, and they get logged back to a, a database. And it's whether we could have a look at that data and identify any worrying deviations in people's habits and routines. So uh, over the upcoming years, the, all the big energy providers will be installing a set of um, energy de reading devices in people's properties, an energy meter for electricity, a gas meter, and a hub, which you can see there, which we use as a Q technology to sort of interface with to get the real-time energy readings. And they use basically a back-end um, infrastructure, Telefonica, um, which is O2, to log all this data back to a massive data warehouse, which energy suppliers use for basically making grid predictions, so load on postcode to see whether they can balance the grid. Now, say all the big, big six energy suppliers are all signed up to do this and committed to putting these devices into every person's home. So the UK um, will basically install 50 million of these smart meters in every commercial and domestic property throughout the UK, and they've got a 
target date of 2020, which is most likely going to slip. You might see it in the press lately about this date moving massively. And what was really attractive when we pitched this to the NHS was that the rollout costs and the ongoing maintenance of these devices is with the suppliers. We can just request to tap into the data feed on this. So they're not having to do any contractual ongoing costs to maintain the sensory equipment. So basically, um, the data for smart meters can be logged from 30 minute intervals to 10 second intervals. That, that's the sort of data collection range. Um, and basically, at 30 minute intervals, we can sort of tell whether they're in the house or not. We can basically tell high level routine. So are they getting up in the morning? Are they making the dinner in the afternoon? And are they going to bed at night? Or are they getting up in the middle of the night? Um, at one minute intervals, we can start identifying major appliances which are in the home. And that was key for us because it's no good just telling whether someone's in the house and whether they're getting up in the morning. If you've got dementia, we need to make sure that you're eating and drinking and that you're interacting with devices. And at one second intervals, we can go right down to look at energy efficient devices. We can even look right down to fridge oscillation patterns in order to establish what energy is being pulled from those energy efficient devices. This is key really in order to build a picture up of the person's routine and see whether there's any deviation. So for that, we've partnered with NHS Merseycare to get some expert advice on what sorts of patterns in um, behaviors that we should be looking for for dementia and other mental problems. And one of the ones that always kept coming up was um, sleep disturbances for severe depression. So if you're getting up at early hours of the morning, that might give you an indication um, whether there's gonna be an onset of some sort of mental breakdown that an, an early outreach team could intervene much earlier on opposed to having to be admitted to hospital. And what they basically said to us that a lot of people with severe depression exhibit very, very similar change in behaviors as what dementia patients do. So they have loss of mobility, memory problems, eating, appetite changes. And these, as we look through the source of the list, we sort of picked up on very key things we could pick up just by looking at people's energy usage. Um, so again, appetite changes, sleep disturbances, unusual behavior. A person suffering with dementia and um, will tend to, as they progress later on in the stages of dementia, will start coming more active between the hours of four and seven o'clock at night. So we could tell, a consultant could tell just by their energy usage, whether they're progressing to later stages of dementia um, without having to do their MSE scores, which is a basically a cognitive test that they usually performed in the surgery. So we can intervene much earlier on. Uh, what was also highlighted was if that medication's changed. So we could see if patient's medication changes, whether they um, they worsen in their behavioral activities during the day. And it'll help the consultant make a, a good judgment whether that medication was the right change or not. Because usually when patients go to the consultants, one of the things which is highlighted is that they don't tell accurate truths, especially people who suffer like psychosis. They say, oh yeah, I've been perfectly fine, but they might have stayed in bed all day. And that would be reflected in their energy usage. So we sort of split up what the system would be able to um, actively monitor. So the first one was to proactively monitor someone for emergency intervention. So this is someone with someone maybe with dementia who's had a fall, uh, an alert message could be sent to a relative or an outreach team to go and assess the patient if there's some really worrying trends. If you've got someone with dementia that gets up pretty much every morning and then on the third or fourth morning there's no electricity usage, that'd be a big concern. You'd have to intervene much earlier on. The second one was to detect uh, make prediction and changes uh, for early intervention practice. So an example of that would be if you've got a patient that's consistently just sitting in a chair, um, they could lead to pressure sores, they could lead to um, blood infections. So it was to pick up on changes in energy that might reflect that type of behavior. So most of the people who get submitted to um, hospital um, for dementia isn't because of the dementia itself, it's because of a byproduct of either being immobile or not looking after themselves properly. So it's very costly to the NHS. So we can pick up on that much earlier on, give them a late and outreach team to go out. And the final one we sort of come up with was to be able to make prediction on progression, like I talked to you before, picking up on key activities or alterations in those activities that could give an indication of a worsening condition and make a prediction on that. That was the third sort of um, system design that we were gonna address. I'm just gonna talk about a case study now. We've got a large data set of um, 78,000 people at 30 minute um, readings, but what we come to very quickly realize, uh, look, looking at the data at 30 minute intervals, 
restricts the range of activities that can be actively monitored for. It's, as I say before, there's no point just saying that they're getting up in the morning. We need us to look really closely at the device interaction in order to make this a viable system. Um, <coughs> so we contacted NHS Mersey Care and we went out and showed them the system. I've uh, done a live demonstration of a data capture and they've agreed to install a large number of energy monitors in people's homes, suffering people with dementia, mental health problems, um, to actually get um, those detail interactivities with the devices that we were talking about. So in order to address that restriction on the initial data set, we're going to gather data at 10 second um, intervals, which represents the lowest frequency that smart meters can go at. There's no point in going to a live feed because if smart meters can't um, do that, there's no point in um, setting our devices to do the same. Okay. Um, so this is our source of setup. We've got an electric, electricity meter, a monitor, and it interfaces with their home router. And we've got a set of Hyper-V clustered machines with a back-end database to log all the, database, uh, the data to. And these are the devices that are sort of fit inside the premise. Um, where patients have got smart meters, we'll use their smart meters. But again, because the rollout was slow, we'll be fitting these to simulate the smart meter data collection process. And we have a trial down there. And it th it, I've done the presentation last year, 30 minute intervals, you, you didn't see much information about their individual sort of daily habits. So what we done when we installed this device, we turned on different um, devices in the, in the property so to get a baseline for the electricity information that we, we've got. And we can even go down, this is a, an energy reading for a kettle, so we can tell how many times during the day they're making a kettle. Another suggestion which was also we put forward was fitting very specific light bulbs to certain rooms in the property. So we could actually tell what rooms the patient was going in and out of to see whether they're going to the toilet abnormally or wherever in the evening. And it's so granular, that's the fridge oscillation. Um, so that's the pattern of just the, the rolling that the fridge sort of goes over. In the live data screen, we can even tell when the fridge light turns on, it's that granular. So we can be really, really predictive about what they're doing. Just quickly, um, so all this data is getting logged back to Microsoft Azure, which is a cloud platform. And in order to do the classification techniques on it, we use the uh, machine learning studio in order to do the, um, the two-class classification, whether the behavior is normal or abnormal. And then we deploy that to an Amazon, uh, sorry, an Azure web service, which can then can interfa interface with the, the end applications. And this is the process. So as the screen comes through, um, the classifier determines whether the behavior is normal or abnormal. And if it's just a mild change in behavior, it sends a signal to the patient through a device just to do a check-in. And if that patient checks in within a certain period of time, it cancels the alert. If they don't, um, basically the alert's sent to a third-party carer to, to contact the patient just to make sure that they're okay. We've done a good number of publications on it, um, just on the 30-minute um, uh, data results, but not, nothing yet with the live data results, which we'll be doing hopefully soon. Let's take any questions. Yeah, so the, when we agree with the NHS, this will only be targeted at the 800,000 people that are living individually in the UK. Um, it's not that great if you've got multiple family members in the house, because obviously you're picking up on their energy usage. But the idea is to promote independent living for people that are living solely. And a lot of people are, I say there's 800,000 people in the UK that live solely with these conditions. It's a massive drain. We'd hope that family members would pick up on alterations in their behavior and intervene earlier. This is a system for people who can't have that immediate family interaction. Yeah, we, we were thinking about clustering, um, but again, we didn't want to do that type of analysis on the 30 meter, a 30 minute data set that we've got. But hopefully when we get the larger data set that's you know, specific to the condition, yeah, it'd be a good way to find natural um, separation in the data. Yeah, I mean, they do. Um, it depends on, uh, carers log in a diary when they're coming to see a patient, so they'll come either two or three times a day in a set interval. That would obviously have to be f into the training classification. 
So these classifiers will be trained on, on the routines of the patients end to end. It's not going to be a generalized one. So it gets to know the actual in, individual patients inside out. Yeah, so usually they do log it when they come up. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, the hope is, again, once we've got the data set and analyzed it, we'd hope that the classifiers will be trained per person. So one of the, the examples is the engineer goes in and fits the devices. What we're going to get them to do is turn on all the electrical devices in the house, the key ones that they interact with, in order to establish. Because, again, energy readings for a kettle is different from make and model. So they will have to go in and switch everything on initially in order to get the baseline for all that sort of stuff. So we can then make a model that truly represents just that person's interactions. So we're hoping to run the data capture for these, um, the, the, the patients in question, for over either a six to 12 month period. Because again, it's gonna fluctuate the time of year as well. So the time you put your night lights on in winter will deviate from the time in summer. So you're really gonna have to gather the data over a long period of time. I think a year um, is, is an acceptable amount of time. The only problem is we're dealing with patients that fluctuate really heavily in mood swings, especially dementia patients. So they might get a baseline for someone at the first 12 months and then they progress. So yeah, I mean, we could, we could, the idea would be to obviously install these devices in a matching set of people that don't suffer from any of these sets of conditions in order to see the deviations. But again, it, it, it does depend on the data when we get it just to see how we manage that. But my, my vision would be to install these in uh, an equal set of non-suffering patients in order to make a baseline comparison. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Learning discussion about system biology modeling of the FEMA micro environment. Can everyone hear me, yeah? Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, hi everyone, my name's Darren. And a little bit of background on me before I start. Uh, I transferred to JMU in November down from University of Liverpool. And up there I was working in the gastroenterology department. So a lot of this uh, presentation is based on that work and not so much on the mathematical side, but uh, it's the mathematical side that uh, drove this research to begin in the first place. So the aims were to understand and predict how different types of myofibroblasts interact with the different epithelial cells in the gastro uh, gastrointestinal tract. And these are AGS and 3081 cells, which I'll explain a bit later, and how we can use this uh, experimental data to make a mathematical model to help with these uh, predictions. So these are the AJS cells. They were derived from a gastro and adenocarcinoma cancer cell line. They're epithelial cell phenotype. Uh, when the phenotype of epithelial cells is a colum columnar. They're not supposed to change shape very much and they're supposed to hold as a wall within, uh, within uh, the stomach. The 3081 cells uh, are stromal myofibroblasts. 
these uh, cell types are more migratory and proliferate a lot more than epithelial cells. The slash one denotes that these cells reside in the cancer niche. So there are different types of uh, myofibroblasts depending on where they're situated with, uh, within the cancer. So there's normal tissue myofibroblasts, which are, uh, aren't uh, you know, the cancer associated tissue myofibroblasts, which are in the region. And these cancer social ones, which have their phenotype has been affected by the cancer cells. And these cells are much more uh, migratory and prolifer uh, proliferative than the normal tissue myofibroblasts. So in this one, we can see uh, that normal tissue myofibroblasts uh, regulate a healthy epithelium. So the ep epithelium is nice and structured, no change in shape. However, during acute inflammation, the myofibroblasts become activated and uh, fix uh, the inflammation. But during chronic inflammation, we get the epigenetic changes within the myofibroblasts. This is when they begin to change their phenotype and start to misbehave. And part of that misbehavior is uh, they become uh, more proliferative and, my, uh, and migration increases, and they stop uh, listening to the signals from the epithelial cells to stop this. So then you get the epithelial cells uh, undergoing uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, which just means they lose their phenotype and start to become more stromal. And as these are meant to be a barrier, that's not very good uh, for the person involved. So the way we did this was we used an IBD chamber, which is just a, an insert with a 500 micron gap. It's the similar to a scratch wound assay, but the advantage of using this is we can have two cell types, whereas in the scratch wound assay, you just bring a pipe, pipette tip through one cell type and watch how the wound closes. So we put uh, the cancer cells 50,000 of them in a one side IBD chamber and 100,000 myofibroblasts in the right hand side. Left it overnight in their respective media. We removed the chamber and uh, put it into a time lapse mic uh, microscope, which is here. Images were taken every 10 to 30 minutes overnight. The 30 minute images were used to create a video to show the migration, and the 10 minute ones were used so I could track individual cells because when it used the 30 minute images, it was hard to keep track of individual cells because of the increased migration. And then we were able to plot these on the data for, on the graphs for analysis. <coughs> so this is the first result. I, so just to explain, in the IBD chambers, this middle part, the AGS side, when we're talking about this side, I am referring to them as AGS proximal and 3081. Uh, proximal, and uh, when I'm taking images of these on the outside of the IBD chamber, I refer to them as distal. So this uh, first result is the proximal side where the two cell types are facing each other. So hopefully this YouTube link will work. Yeah, it's working on here. So these are the AGS cells. You can see almost immediately they lose their epithelial phenotype and become more mesenchymal. Uh, and <laughs> in response to the presence of the myofibroblasts. And the myofibroblasts you can see are a lot less migratory compared to these epithelial cells. So <coughs> it shows how much more aggressive in migration uh, that these cancer cells are compared to their myofibroblast counterpart. But you can see that both cells actively move towards each other. And this is the distal uh, side of the cells. So we're using the distal side as a control uh, for what's going on in the middle.
is distal on the distal side. You can see that once again uh, the epithelial phenotype is completely dispersed, and they get these stromal cells, which you can tell by these projections that are coming out of the leading cells as they as they search into the space. And when we plot this on the graph, <coughs> with the AGS versus three of its cells, so it was every three hours I took a, I measured the area of the cells. So every three hours I. At zero, at, at hour zero, I took the area that was already in the image, and then every three hours, I took how far in area they've moved from that image. So the AGS control cell, which was those distal, that distal video you seen last, you can see how much more area these cells move into compared to uh, the proximal and the distal 308 cell. So the 308 one myofibroblasts in the proximal side, so facing the uh, uh, cancer epithelial cells, moved the least and that's due in part to the aggressive nature of the proximal cancer cells and that it closed up all the space that uh, these myofibroblasts had the potential to move into. But interestingly, on the outside where it had unlimited space, there was still very little movement of the myofibroblast cells. So our conclusions uh, from that, that particular data was that the AGS cell shows uh, more random movement. The cells kind of just spun off in different directions into the space, especially within the distal cells. There is e epithelial mesenchymal transition where they lost their epithelial phenotype and exhibited more stromal phenotype, and they slow as they approach the 3081 cells. And it's hard to determine from those videos whether the driving force of them towards the myofibroblast cells were the myofibroblast secreting a uh, chemo factor to draw them towards it, or were they was it more contact inhibition with each other that they tried to move into the space? The 3081 uh, proximal cells were a lot more predictable than AGS, and they showed clear movement towards AGS cells uh, through membrane potential uh, is the leading theory at the minute. And we, can sh we showed that the AGS migration is more aggressive on the distal side, and the 3081 migration is similar in both proximal and distal sides. So as we were showing up here, the movement looks uh, random. So that's where the cell tracking uh, came into, into it. Okay, that's where the cell tracking came into it. Um, so I tracked a couple of cells, these particular cells to show, to see what kind of uh, migration we were actually uh, getting out of them. And you can see that at the beginning, they're all very direct towards the myofibroblasts. But as as they get closer to the myo uh, myofibroblast cells, they start to tail off more, and begin begin to spin and go back and change from side to side. So again, is, are they being attracted at the beginning, or is the myofibroblast releasing uh, inhibitor factors? Uh, it's what we need to determine from the the a literature research. Uh, on this one, it's the, a, a similar kind of thing. They come, they come out straight, but then they bend down here r rather than going into the YouTube again. So from that data, we've seen that there's direct migration at the beginning of the time lapse. Is it factors released or contact inhibition that's driving uh, this kind of migration behavior? Uh, there needs to be more done in the lit research. But one thing the lit research does agree on, nobody really knows how the, what uh, the myofibroblasts uh, effect is on these cells. So that's what why this model will be useful. Um, the initial bit of math modeling we've done, this is a fixed law, uh, which uh, just shows a movement in high concentration to low concentration. So if you imagine this green line is the edge of the cells, each one of these blue lines is the three hour time points and how far away they've moved from the cells into the space. Uh, the X mean is at the 50% point, how far they've moved out. So it's just over 200 for the AGS cells, which is the 50% mark. Uh, this diffusion coefficient is just the driving force based on the differential surface energies of the system. And when you compare it to the 308, you can see that uh, the driving force of the cancer cells is much, much higher than the 308 cells. And the final bit, 
the final bit of math model we're going to do is the cellular pots model, which is a lattice-based model where uh, we can put the dynamic changes we see in the cells into, uh, into lattice sets where they all have their own cell boundaries and area rules for moving. And this one is just to show how a leading edge uh, breaks off in a cancer. So all the cells move away. And they begin, once, once they break, uh, these all move back into the main body and the leading edge continues to metastasize a different set. So at, at this moment, it's very early in the stages of the mathematic mathematical modeling bit, but we've got a lot of qualitative data that we can put numbers on to, to help explain what's going on and help uh, the biologists with their experiments and where to move next. And that's it. Thank you. <coughs> Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. I have uh, a slide there. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. The visual are very, very impressive. In, in the process of the, the analysis, it wasn't always clear in what part of the process is the done automatically, what is done mat manually, and mm -hmm. what part is done through methods, basically, because uh, we have some, we have some images, and they are measuring area, they are deducing some, some data from this, and then we have some uh, images, and video needs to have a system that is tracking, yeah. but without this system, will be a half automatic. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you could clarify this one. Um, so all the, Im all the videos were made from stitching together images taken every 30 or, t or in the case of the cell tracking every 10 minutes out of the time lapse uh, microscope and using ImageJ software with a manual tracking plugin, I went for through each image and so I chose a cell at the beginning and tagged it and then I moved to the next image and followed it and I think, ta I, think I had to tag each one 96 times over the 18 hour period. And then that generated a, a video for me where it would follow the cell for me. Okay. That's why I had to do 10 minutes, because when I did 30 minutes, I got maybe to sixth, seventh image, and then the cell got lost in the clusters. And the problem with doing it with 10 minutes is, as you've seen in that uh, last video, the time lapse had a tendency to go out of focus a lot uh, when it was asked to do too much. So it was kind of made the job even harder trying to track them. But I managed to get five cells that show quite clearly that. The the leading the satellite cells, if if you want, come straight out of the pack, and as they get towards the myofibroblast, they almost it's like they hit a wall and stop and turn around. But because it's only videos, we can't really say why that is. So it's completely qualitative, and that's where the modeling uh, will come in because we can put the dynamics of what we see in the videos into the math mathematics, give them energies, adhesion energies between each other, between the extracellular matrix, between the different cell types. And once we get a mathematical model that matches up to the video, we know that this is the cellular dynamics and this is most likely what's happening. We can tell the biologists and then they can create experiments to see if we're right or wrong in our predictions. Mm -hmm. How far are you in producing the results for mathematical models? Uh, we're very close uh, to having the model done. We're just having a little uh, problems with the cells that are stuck together, mm -hmm. not behaving how, they how they're we're seeing it in the videos. But it's just about getting some uh, some of the energies uh, right, and maybe a few more parameters to uh, straighten things up. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yes, so uh, that's uh, one of the questions, because they're kept in uh, the media overnight, so obviously there's a l there can be communication across the chemical gradient. And it's whether or not that initial part, the myofibroblasts are attracting the cells, but I think there's definitely enough video evidence to suggest that the myofibroblasts are having an effect on stopping them uh, from progressing. Yeah.
one of the other uh, communication things we're looking at is the myofibroblasts lay down a lot of extracellular matrix and there will be none in that gap. So another reason for the slowing up might be that the cancer cells r are remodeling the extracellular matrix that's been set down by the myofibroblast cells. But in the literature, they use that, uh, that network to uh, travel to different parts of the body and metastasize. So it's kind of contradictory at the minute. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casimiro Adai Curbelo Montañez, and I'm here today to talk about my research proposal, Intelligent, intelligent System for the Classification and Early Prediction of Polygenic Obesity in Humans. Before we start, I would like to let you know that I'm uh, still in the first year of my uh, PhD, so uh, for that reason, my uh, results and methodology are still limited, mm -hmm. uh, and I have divided the presentation, as you will see next. Obesity is the problem I would like to play a part in reducing, as you probably guessed from the previous picture and from the um, title of my presentation. And according to the World Health Organization, more than 1.9 billion adults were overweight and 600 million were obese worldwide in 2000, 2014. Sorry. Um, today, obesity is one, of, is one of the most difficult clinical and public health challenges worldwide. It reduces life, life expectancy by an average of three years or eight to 10 years in case of severe obesity. This is why obesity is high in the political agenda of many countries. Uh, also, obesity leads to other uh, important diseases such as type two diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, premature death, hypertension, arthritis, a stroke, as well as certain type of cancer. So when we think about obesity, it is easy to think that, okay, if we consume too, mu too, much, ca too much calories, uh, then our body can burn. Uh, we don't practice any exercise. We have a sedentary lifestyle. It is quite likely that uh, we become obese. This is especially aggravated in environments where low cost food and a high uh, calorie food is available, especially in developed countries. And this type of environment is what we call uh, obesogenic environment. However, in spite of those elements, there are evidences, uh, there are, sorry, differences in the sensitivity of an individual to obesity that suggest an involvement of genetic risk factor. Okay, so as many common diseases, obesity is influenced by a combination of multiple factors, including genetics, environmental and lifestyle factors. That's why we refer to obesity as a complex disease, and so it could be difficult to treat. But the question now is, how do we measure the, uh, the risk, oh sorry, how do we measure the genetics of obesity? We can monitor the amount of uh, exercise we, we perform, we can control the amount of it we eat, but how do we, uh, how do we know if someone uh, has a, uh, sorry, a predisposition to the development of obesity. Well, according to experts in genetics, slight variations in our DNA sequence can have a major impact on whether or not we develop a disease. And for the reason, uh, I will try to identify DNA variations associated to obesity. So, we, you know we are organisms formed by cells. Each cell 
contains the instructions for what they need to do in our bodies. And that instructions is what we call DNA. This is a very, very schematic uh, explanation of DNA. Um, in terms of this, especially in terms of this uh, research, I like to describe the DNA sequence as a, a string of approximately three billion bases or, um, or characters, well, characters or bases called nucleotides, okay? We have four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and the combination of this, uh, those bases or nucleotides makes our DNA sequence. So now as humans, our uh, DNA sequence is 99.9 .9 identical, but there are some variations that make us unique. These variations is what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, SMP, and sometimes they could be related to normal traits like the color of our eyes, the shape of our hair, or other times they could be linked to a specific diseases. Um, and that's the, m the, the most important point for uh, our uh, research. I have included here an example of an individual genetic profile um, similar to the one I'm using in my uh, experiments at the moment where each observation represent a SNP, okay? Where the RSID is the name of the ID of the SNP, the chromosome where it was located, where it was identified, the position in the DNA strand and the genotype that will indicate if that a SNP represent a risk or not. Okay, so SNPs are the most common type of genetic variation. Identifying those SNPs associated with particular diseases might help, will help us to predict an individual's likelihood to, uh, of developing a disease. And we know that from genome-wide association studies. This, this particular studies look for genetic variation, analyzing or scanning the whole uh, genome or the whole DNA sequence looking for specific uh, diseases in many people, okay? And from these studies, uh, uh, well, those studies suggest that SNPs in certain genes can be associated with obesity risk factor and body mass index. I will move now on into my current work. Um, I have conducted a case-only study where we analyzed 68 samples of extremely obese people, 68 uh, genetic profiles of extremely obese people. We got that data from the Sanger Institute. And rather than conducting our own genome-wide association study to identify the SNPs associated with our disease, we took advantage of a manually curated and publicly available data set with results from genome-wide association study. It's called the National Human Genome Research Institute catalog. So what we did, what, what we, what we did basically, uh, we checked the frequency of the SNPs in the 68 uh, people with extremely obese, uh, that were extremely obese, and then we check which of these SNPs were indexed in the National Human Genome Research Institute catalog. <laughs> okay, so this is um, a plot of the results we got. We, uh, we managed to identify 39 uh, SNPs, uh, uh, obesity-related SNPs, sorry. Each of these dots represent a SNP, where the X, y, uh, axis represent the chromosomes where, it, where they were located, and the Y axi uh, axis is where the um, traits, well, the, the obesity-related traits of these um, SNPs. The color of each dot represent the, fr represent the frequency in all the samples, okay? So we managed to identify 39, but perhaps the most prominent was this one here in chromosome three that was associated to waist to hip ratio, a commonly um, way of measuring obesity. But we found other, we found, uh, we identified SNPs related to uh, body mass, uh, birth weight, eating disorders, fat body mass, and so on, okay? So just as a summary, we analyzed 68 extremely obese uh, profiles. We uh, look for the SNPs in those profiles to see if they were indexed in the genome-wide association studies in, the ca in this catalog. 
We identified 39, 39 obesity related SNPs, and then the most prominent was this SNP RS6784615 related to waist to hip ratio. But we also identify some SNPs that were related to other diseases and particularly to type 2 diabetes. And of course, we have data limitation because we only analyzed 68 profiles. We didn't have any controls, just cases, and we didn't have any clinical data or anything, just the genetic information about, about the, the files. So just I'm about to finish. Now, um, I would like to to tell you a little bit about what I will do next and what I'm doing a, a little bit. Yep. So at the moment, I'm collecting my own data using web scraping techniques from uh, the Personal Genome Project, which is a project conducted by Harvard University where participants agree to upload their genetic information to share it with the community. So I managed to download 164 uh, participants' information, including the genetic profile and the, some demogra demographic information. So what I'm planning to do is identify now if there is a correlation between SNPs associated to obesity and SNPs related to other diseases, okay? We will like to use these results for prediction. We haven't decided yet exactly what models we will use, but uh, we are gonna use machine learning models to see if those results are good inputs for predicting someone's predisposition to obesity. And we have also applied to another data set from DBGAP with case control data with ca uh, cases of obese people because we understand that this amount of data is not enough for our uh, purpose. And just to summary um, my PhD a little bit and the aims of my PhD, the goal of this research is to implement and evaluate machine learning and data analytics mechanisms in line with the causative factors associated to obesity. Special emphasis will be placed in, on understanding the relationship between susceptibility to obesity SNPs and secondary comorbidities such as type 2 diabetes to objectively measure the degree of risk personalized to the individual. This will be a multidisciplinary uh, research project that will include expertise in genetics, data science, and machine learning. So hopefully at the end of my PhD, I'm hoping to help with this evolution and not with the one we saw at the beginning of the picture. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> oh. Sorry. No. I'm a friend. No, no, no. Uh, that's a good question, actually, because uh, I've been trying to get publicly available data for a long time, and this particular uh, project, the Personal Genome Project, has a lot of information, a lot of genetic profiles, and also clinical data and demographic information for uh, participants, and they basically agree to upload them for free. And, of course, not all the information there is useful for the purpose of my project, so I decided, okay, why not to get what I need and create my own data set. So we just focus in a few uh, small parameters like uh, the genetic profile, because normally it has loads of uh, uh, observations, and also information like the gender, the weight, height, sex, or, or, or um, sorry, the, uh, ma I mentioned the gender, and also the age of the participants. But we will probably um, obtain more information in the future, but at the moment we are uh, focusing in that, yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So uh, I'm using a software for data analytics and visualization. It's an open source called R, R or RStudio in that case. Mm -hmm. So I'm using some specific packages within R for the visualizations and uh, for the cleaning process as well. environmental factors as well, uh, yes. Yeah, that's, that, that I'm sorry. Exactly, um, with the data I'm, I am collecting at the moment, I'm not including that type of information, 
That's why we have applied for this case control data set in DBGAP, because we check and it, they have information about, um, you know, uh, infor clinical information about the patients, what they eat, uh, if they uh, perform activity regularly. So probably that would be a more complete solution for, for our experiments in the future. But as you say, we have some constraints in our, in the data I'm collecting at the moment as well. Let's see if I understood. Uh, so it, it is true that there are exons and introns in our DNA sequence, where introns are the part of the DNA sequence that doesn't encode for proteins. So people think, oh well, or through the research, it's be, it's believe or it's been think that they don't do anything with our in our uh, structure, but actually they could be linked to the coding part, which is the exons, and they could be related. Your question is, is if I am uh, taking that into consideration in my... Yes, um, this is the mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. I'm not going that further, I think, at the moment. So basically, I'm relying on previously reported uh, results from genome-wide association studies, and I'm relying on that information. So I'm not taking into consideration if that um, a SNP will be cause or will cause definitely um, a problem to the person or not. I'm not sure if I understood the question very well. Okay, thanks for telling everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Grumby. My PhD project is on size and self-reliant network technologies for situational awareness in a security context. My supervisor, Dr. Bob Astrick, and Angelus Monorides. I'm not too sure if I was anyone else. Anyway, anyway, just a quick overview of uh, the work we've been doing at the moment. So we've observed over the past, say, five to ten years, an increased number of security incidents reported in the news. So we've we kind of put this down to new technologies that introduce non-traditional increased attack surfaces. And what, what I mean by that is a typical computing network, which would be a closed or layered secure system is now kind of a lot borderless when we consider the cloud environment. So in these we find Shared resources amongst many tenants, multi tenancy to use a lot better utilized computing resources, highly distributed and public facing. So, the problem that is, we find existing security solutions were limited toward these environments. In the case of, they were never designed to secure a public facing environment. So, that's mainly due to an increased number of diverse applications that we find with mobile devices, internet of things, the fridge, the toaster, whatever else being connected to the internet. And we need to start considering the log management complexities and monitoring these systems. They start growing, the 
well, quite com incomprehensible. It makes, well, make <coughs> making use of meaningful data for its curious point of view quite difficult because it's that fast. It's just that continuous. And these are with given plans, and no one, fi one size fits all solution. Um, the distribution nature of these kind of limits the political state that's now essential for making informed security decisions. However, there are, well, there have been a couple of new technologies that have emerged that facilitate the development of new methods to derive this. So these are software defined networking, which I guess traditional working sense, you find the control plane and the gate plane tightly hooked together, so it fits in seamlessly. So yeah, at the bottom two of the right hand side diagram, um, you see the infrastructure layer and the control layer. These are typically bound together quite close, pretty decentralized, hard to manage. With SDN, these are decoupled, which provides a logically centralized but physically distributed control plane, which acts as a network bundle for controller, many, many network devices which can be physical and distributed. The control API is between this is a stock bound implement for Linux quite at the moment it's standard would be the open flow protocol come out of Stanford in 2008. Um, this we can deploy network applications at the top which can interface with the control plane and interpret network flow tables or network flow control. The application plane in this you kind of gain a global view of what's going on in the network from an infrastructure layer at least. This enables us to develop security applications that consider the whole global infrastructure as opposed to these are centralized, currently li limited uh, deployments required. The second part of this would be network into virtualization. So, this is reducing the amount of physical network elements within an infrastructure and sort them into single function each standard service that can act as many different places so they can kind of stake a standard virtualized instance and they can reduce the cost massively. Um, by that you can deploy new servers a lot faster, reduce the maintenance time. Uh, it breaks the vendor locking paradigm that we find so an existing network device is typically quite locked down. You can't really interface much, it's going to be constrained by very specific protocols or programming languages you actually need things with them. Um, it's also virtualized, so you can scale a lot more. So they're not constrained just to a fixed set of resources. They can utilize a pool of resources, which is typically consolidated in a... It's consolidated away from the physical device and pulled together into kind of virtualized resources. Uh, these are Say what virtualized network devices, virtual storage, virtual compute and processor, and the data interposal. So these are you can take advantage of many different infrastructures in this interact or data centers that share a common format for virtualized devices or virtualized function network functions. And you consider intrusion detection, but going back to the limitations of well existing models that are typically too two that we consider as well least prominent throughout the literature. So it's image based detection which is about to live today, which we assign because it is it's pass not passive analysis of network traffic that aims to identify malicious signatures. Um you do this by maintaining a database of known signatures. Uh the limits in the sense that they can fail to detect new or unknown attacks or incidents is not available. Um it's just not going to detect this. This is going to be missed. Classification is limited by this as well. Uh, quite easy to implement in comparison to lambda based intrusion detection. There are evasion techniques which further limit them. Didn't discuss the fact that you need to inspect every single packet in the flow or sample for at least. Which is the way these devices are implemented. You can introduce performance bottlenecks so they need to be placed in attack points of an infrastructure. And again, we rely on the creation of those signatures. So these limitations are kind of concerning, given the increased number, increased amount of cyber security recently. 
so by that means there's, there's a lot more work around all new basic achievement detection so this is statistical analysis uh, aimed to kind of detect anomalous patterns that can conform to expected operation the expected operation is maintained in terms of a trained profile so in that sense we need to create and maintain a system profile which can take a long time the suggested you can detect no known attack but of course you don't rely on signatures they're kind of more behavioral in the sense that you can go up and say well this is anomalous it's not normal the problem with that is classification of these attacks are not always accurate you can't always get an accurate read on what this is it's a really difficult thing to control because it requires you know, expertise in this type of thing so you've got to typical you know, like engineer to implement this you're probably going to struggle uh, it can be vulnerable to manipulation over time so attackers can train these systems to accept the behavior they consider to normal it's typically quite system loss specific, service specific in the sense that it's only suited towards the model that's in the system that has been trained to uh, defend high policy positive rate in comparison to change based detection tool because just because it's anomalous does not always mean it's malicious and selection me meaningful features for security is quite challenging it can often be a problem well always is problem specific so the challenge of key observations that sense is operationally there's a lot of diversifications with lots of different protocols and usage and obviously we're not kind of confined to this it, this protocol is for this service and all uh, the increased attack surface pool because it's a public basin and there's a lot more devices in that sense with public APIs which are very easily affected with and the problem client updates are typically problem specific so in that sense we mean securing some one service may not necessarily be the same as securing the next uh, the highly distributed so technically challenged in that sense that we have virtualization so we have lots of different tenants utilizing the same hardware it's not always possible to say okay we know it is being targeted let's just say it's just some of you might <laughs> to learn the uh, system is um, you can find with time sensitive functions so virtualization can increase the delay in this it's been suggested from our point of view change in malicious behavior of attacks as well so modeling a cyber attack may not always be quite as simple as going okay that's it we know that is definite now it's going to change over time again an increased challenge and becomes a problem so security in that sense have multi data types and sources in the sense of data could become well um so multiple data types and sources so the data being monitored is not always suggestive of where of where <coughs> of attack sources um or attack target maybe as well in some sense some senses and existing solutions are generally quite slack in the sense of you don't have the dynamic properties required this in a okay this in a distributed sense of view it's kind of limited so if you have monitoring distributed throughout multiple different points correlating all this data becomes computation expensive for storage as well as processing so in terms of this we're looking at container based container based technologies for utilizing well for utilizing container based technologies for network security so it's a platform for securing emerging digital technologies it provides a global view of the infrastructure state which provides short awareness in the sense of it can utilize uh level related to increase of the network layer which switches from a global point of view which aggregates towards the controller who represents a global network state and utilizing the level four to layer seven leak state of which is more in terms of these services being posted within the service we aim to provide a catalog of existing anomaly detection algorithms which can be experiments with different use cases to find generally which is the best or which suited towards a specific problem a uh, unified schema for implementing, implementing particular monitoring requirements within the system so this can be 
you could well, want to think on uh, how you kind of implement a problem security into the services via JSON REST interface, which enables us to kind of yeah. So both of these contain technologies and overflow technologies as well as the JSON REST interface for managing configuration. The container technologies are lightweight and support functions and you can scale them horizontally across the whole infrastructure and the Nvidia new graphics to initiate. They integrate instantly into these new technologies. The five faults are and so you can configure them to 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 kind of pick up on early signs of high load or suggested problems again in the dimension graphic to initiate. So it's quick system overview of this and let's put this as um, let's design it as um, progress to data instances. So we've identified 12 algorithms which we're going to utilize throughout the experiment phase of our project. Current analyzing service crash characteristics to kind of get the feel for what is going to be more indicative for the security purpose for securing different services in the application for the value session. Yeah, there are some problems with that in terms of algorithm, algorithm implementation as well. Uh, we've ascertained these build containers towards, well, the functional requirements in a sense, in comparison to those that have been influenced. We've identified appropriate schema markups so we use the JSON because it's still the native in the system. It, it integrates well, there's no need to really modify it. That's the purpose of those tests, I suppose. Um, and currently, just note, we compose an existing security solution to this scalable single function module, so not so monolithic. Um, and we are currently in the process of designing and implementing the test bed in the network appliance lab for real experimentation. So the Atomos project will be a platform to facilitate global situational awareness, security, and emerging architectures. It will enable the embedding of security specific and monitoring requirements for a useful experiment. Uh, we do intend on looking at applying some policies to enable reactive configuration in the sense of that we also, well, we use the <coughs> seem to experiment with this, but this is a key to work. Um, do intend on, well, this will be configurable by a user interface that sends the schema and the overall goal is to reduce the complexities associated with implementing these emergent, well, these sensitive security instruments in these architectures. Thanks, Ben. Is there any questions? JSON at the moment is pretty lightweight in terms of the well, the new technology is already natively in there, so there's no point in changing it or extending it when it's already there as it is. But at the same time, the lightweight in the sense of it's although it's lightweight web technology, um, it can be extended really quickly, and it just needs to be made really fast. Oh right, okay, so layer 2, layer 3, we need layer 2, layer 3, layer 4 and 7 in the network, so layer 2 and 3 would represent the, the underlying network infrastructure, the data plane, okay. it's where network graphics communicate throughout towards the service, so layer 4 and 7 would be where the service meter data is obtained from. Um, and at that point you can kind of guess, okay, is this a volumetric attack, is it a DDoS attack, what type of service is it attacking, is it data exfiltration, is it... How do you process that? Um, so, OpenSlope provides flow statistics as standard, so each switch will count the slope, and in a symmetric that way, well, statistically, so you get apple bytes, uh, Connection request to find how long the flow lived, and then the two endpoints are in <coughs> as identified before the service logs. Thank you. Is it Fondue or Fondue? Fondue. 
from being big data to the generation okay. and then in real time we have the Do you want to yes. hear it? Let's start. Good evening. Try and make this as fast as possible, people. Sorry, after a minute, what are the words? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Tully, and I'm presenting my framework to uh, combine big data, GIS data, into a modern framework for visualizing GIS data. Right, so as I mentioned, the aims of the project is to combine large amounts of GIS data. And when I'm talking about large amounts, I mean like terabytes worth of amounts covering the whole country and technically the whole world, but I'll get into the whole world in a while. Right, so after deliberation and looking at many different data types, ordering survey, OpenStreetMap, Google, um, Bing Maps, uh, we've decided to combine OpenStreetMap data, LiDAR, and other user-defined data. And the reason for this is I believe that modern GIS systems being viewed through web platforms or HTML, they don't use the basically the best part of a computer, the uh, GPU unit to visualize all the data. So in my experience, yeah, you can go down to street view into Google Maps, but all you see is basically images taken from a car. Yeah, it's great, you know where you are, but it'll be good to know about information about that building and to adapt the information on that building. Because, so for instance, knowing is it made out of brick? Okay, how flammable is it? How can we extend this GIS data into something that everyone can use, so firemen, police, army, and even just us who's interested in more GIS data? Basically, yeah, uh, I wanna combine games technology with this to define a new standard of framework. So the good thing about games technology is where you've seen modern games visualize huge terrains, uh, very complex scene graphs, um, basically a scene graph divides a whole scene off into optimized fragments for faster real-time rendering techniques. And what I mean by real-time rendering is anything over 30 frames per second. So you notice like Google Maps, when you load that, tiles are loading in dynamically, you zoom in. I wanna create something where you can just choose where you wanna go and it just loads up a procedural scene with 3D buildings, 3D terrain, and realistic scenes. Right, so, <coughs> excuse me. So the framework, basically what we're gonna need is to create two pipelines. A pipeline to process all the data, as I, I mentioned, it's terabytes worth of data. Being able to procedurally generate 3D scenes, uh, 3D scenes, so to say, and being able to like monetize a world's worth of data into a very small chunk. So instead of like processing the whole world's worth of map data, we wanna be able to just select small scenes just for uh, rapid prototype, uh, prototyping of the framework. And one of the main elements of creating this preprocessor for all this data and procedural scenes is to generate XML files and binary files. The reason why I'm choosing XML files is the fact that it can be loaded in any other system, so MATLAB, any other game engine, just because XML is used in so many frameworks. So this will extend the actual research aims of projects. And the reason why I've chosen binary is just the simple speed that it can be loaded in. So like loading in XML is quite slow, like loading in ASCII files, but binary, especially the streamlined binary that we've created, can load things in almost instant instantaneously, uh, which means loading in large cities worth of data will happen within less than a second. No Google Maps popping up tiles or anything. Excuse <coughs> me. And the second framework that we want to create was the one-time application. So being able to visualize everything within real time. So we're having 3D cameras to zoom down street level and then pop straight up into like um, yeah, being able to do it in God mode so you can view a scene in any instance that you want. But also being able to categorize assets within the scene, so categorize buildings, road types, terrain, and being able to 
basically place any data that we want on top of a, a city's worth of scene. So we want to see uh, pollution uh, details. The AI just will just pop in locations of that, spread out um, shader techniques, which is one on the GPU process, and being able to view scenes in many different angles and many different lights. Some of that Google Maps, well, the reason why I didn't use Google Maps and I used OpenStreetMap was the fact that there's no licenses. We can do what the data, um, we can do anything with the data provided. But the problem with that is the fact that the data itself is very error prone because it's generated by users, as I mentioned. So to generate all this, we need a pre-processing library, which we've created, an XML serializer, which we've created, a one-time library, 3D camera system, input manager, so you know, for touch screens, uh, mouse, keyboard, anything that will allow the majority of users to use, even the Oculus Rift can be used with this system. A triangulator system, a tweener library, this is a, the animation library, so, and I've used WinForms, put a UI in integration, right? So the data in question, LiDAR, so light detection and raging. Basically this is data captured from an airplane that goes over cities, so it comes in two formats, DTM, digital terrain models, and DSM, digital surface models. So this on the right is a texture generated from the digital service model. So that's the, uh, let's see this, Echo Arena, and then Albert Docs. Obviously this is just the texture, so all the actual shadows put in there are just extra procedural stuff, not actually real uh, terms. And when I'm speaking about large chunks of data, the data that we do have, which covers the whole UK, well I say covers, covers the majority of the whole UK, so most of Scotland isn't mapped, but that's 3.6 terabytes. And the reason why it's 6 point terabytes is because there's so much data, because each one of these points, so a pixel here represents every two meters, but we can go down to 25 centimeters. So capturing this from a plane, 800 meters up, uh, using lasers, uh, lasers being bounced off the ground, there's bound to be errors, as in anything in blue means where uh, data isn't captured. And then all this section, uh, this should be blue because it's water, uh, but they've just basically added their own uh, data sets in there. But we want to combine other data sets to maybe improve the LiDAR uh, capabilities. And this is where OpenStreetMap comes in. But as I said, OpenStreetMap is full of errors itself. So we want to combine LiDAR with OpenStreetMap to uh, help each other. So with OpenStreetMap, we have boundary data. So boundary data could be the boundaries of a building generated by users. And for the whole world, currently there's a, a scary number, uh, 666 gigabytes of basically XML files. And underneath, you can't really see it on the screen, but it's just categorized by nodes. So thousands and millions of nodes with uh, tag data. So this tag data could be addresses, telephone numbers, anything. And we want to combine this. So as I mentioned, it's majority made up of nodes, which make up boundaries. And using these boundaries, we can combine that with LiDAR to eventually state. So for this instance, this is all water along the Albert Dock. You see that there's a tiny little raised there in this section. That's error. So we want to use OpenStreetMap to scan around that and lower all the data. Um, thus making the visualizations a little bit crisper, a little bit better. Uh, and to just iterate how much data is on OpenStreetMap or the tiles, so the textures popping through, is uh, commonly uh, 54 terabytes, which, you know, generating all this or process which combines everything, you're going to need a scene graph to split everything up into smaller chunks, smaller processing for individual cities, individual countries. <coughs> when I'm talking about the scene graph, we have created our own novel scene graph. The um, reason why it's novel is it com combines order and survey data and order and survey reference schemes with a scheme that we've generated. So using this scheme, like the top node is the world node, um, which everything is contained in. But then the whole UK is referenced with like the order and survey reference scheme. So each one of these nodes represents 500 kilometers square going down into 100 kilometers square, further down until we get to one kilometer square is what you're seeing on this section. So there's a lot of data in there, but then we want to classify everything within OpenStreetMap into its own scene graph. So we're combining all the buildings into their own nodes, highways, boundaries, and single nodes. Well, what I mean by single nodes is like lab posts, uh, letter boxes, everything else, and then doing terrains. So this means that we can easily go into Liverpool, part of Liverpool, 
and uh, view all the buildings within itself. And this scene graph will hold all the procedural buildings. So what I mean by procedural is, say we've just got 2D points on a scene, and use those points, extrude it, taking off information from OpenStreetMap, so a building's height, make it the building larger, take off the colors uh, of a building's brick and a brick texture to try and generate 3D scenes of a world. So the first prototype that I'll show you is this is Manhattan, uh, all the train networks, so we've got all the trains, uh, road networks, and all the procedural buildings. So this is a very early prototype. You can see that all the buildings are randomly heighted. I want to use LiDAR, get the height of the buildings, reintroduce to the database, better virtual scenes. If you notice the, the textures on these, all the basically the same textures. I want to create a bank of textures to make scenes a bit more visual. So prototype number two, please excuse the uh, terrible textures. They can be replaced, but the actual algorithms underneath are pretty solid. So after processing OpenStreetMap um, files, this process and the um, one-time application scans the hard disk, basically finding out, right, do we have actual files on the system? And if you notice, I haven't processed nothing for Scotland, I haven't processed nothing for this little bit, but I have processed within, cool, uh, within uh, the 500 square kilometers. Keep going down, Hummer Square, 10 kilometers square, so you can see there's Wivel, uh, and then keep going down, select that section, so everything here, has processed data, but we've only processed a tiny bit of uh, OpenStreetMap data. And this is the LiDAR data that we've processed. So I'm using uh, shader technologies. We can view a scene within multiple lights. So it's not very clear on this screen, but I've um, textured it with ordnance survey data so you can see each part of the buildings. You can kind of see a little bit better here, but again, it's the technologies behind it are solid, uh, and it means that we can view a scene in many different rendering techniques. So we wanted to color the whole scene, or every building within the scene red, you can do. So combining that, oh, um, yeah, the user interface that I created means that we can select individual models, translate them, rotate them, add controllers to them. So the controllers, basically, if you select the building, you can make a pulsate highlighting stuff uh, to that individual part, and we can view the scene graph. So eventually, there's gonna be a whole city's worth of data in here. Uh, and a good thing about the system as well is after categorization, a user can select anything they want in the scene, any roads, any buildings, and a combination of these buildings using procedural uh, expressions. So what I mean by that, if I could just say, right, I want a building uh, where the height is above 10 meters, but below 20 meters, and is flammable. And that's what we've done here. So if you notice here, like we've got the 2D, well not the 2D, the procedural building representations, obviously, need better textures, over planted onto the LiDAR terrain, just for visual premise. But here, the red represents a flammable building, where the blue represents a non-flammable roof. So this is particularly interesting to maybe present to the fire brigade, which I am currently on the way. And the future premise is to generate full cities, being able to visualize any shader technique uh, with large terrains in any order that you want. Thank you very much. Hope that was fast. So. Do you have any questions? Sweet. Nice. Done. Not <laughs> kind of not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Your job most of that actually to be uh, to be process. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a number of processes that allow you to to deal with the Western data, the, the, the live data, the process data, and so on. Uh, is there any, do you have any workflow that allows you to reuse your scene, some of the data that have been processed and uh, used to generate, let's say, one of two processes? And uh, how do you do that? So for example, you, you said the area for the old data. So you did processing of the data, and you did unit of value by the, the street, the, the building mm -hmm. and so on. And then you want to, to use in the area of the transport and so on. So I'm interested, how do you do that? Um, if you want to like to move a whole um, building, are you talking about moving like a whole building itself or talking about generating a whole new scene? Or a new scene, yeah. Oh, um, at the minute, everything is just processed uh, through the, f uh, the very first pre-processor. So if you want to visualize that map, that's the only map that we can visualize. What um, can be done is a user can select, okay, I don't want to process everything within the map so we can turn off uh, the terrain if we want. So we just visualize the buildings. 
but as of yet, it's not wrapped and round, so to speak. So the process is seen, but the next stage is to then maybe reprocess certain elements mm -hmm. and then pump them back into the system. So I would like to configure a way to be able to automatically get the heights from the LiDAR of the buildings mm -hmm. um, and then just automatically pump that through to either a text file that can be inputted straight into uh, OpenStreetMap database and then mm -hmm. do it again. So it's a little bit roundabout way, um, but yeah, I definitely need to so figure that out. So the process really to avoid doing the processing so many times. Yeah. The whole thing to just allow you to structure your, your location in terms mm -hmm. of the street and the building and all of the specific things that you need to get. And you get a sort of data structure which are already prepared for this thing. Is there any way to actually store the data somewhere in the whole world? Uh, the result of the yeah, yeah. Um, with every node being uh, exported through XML, that mm -hmm. could be pumped back into the generation process. So we could um, process all the LiDAR and never process it again into 3D model assets because, mm -hmm. frankly, how expensive generating LiDAR is. You only get new data sets within areas once every eight years. So it's quite, could be quite out of date, but yeah, we could put them to the side and then reload them in if we needed to mm -hmm. get high data for buildings or reprocess that. But it's a very roundabout way. Like It's like the chicken and egg. Who came first? Got to reprocess that first to then get data for there or do you do it that way? So it's a very, it needs to be a staggered okay. process. So. Any other questions? Oh, thanks very much. Another, Another one. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a implemented technique which allows the when you're processing maps, it just loads in pre-generated models, uh, but it still needs to have a few bugs fixed. Hence why I didn't uh, mm -hmm. share it here. But it has the ability just to load in models into each one of the um, C nodes, which is saved back to XML. Uh, but there is the ability to load in models at the minute. So if I wanted to view a scene and then, all right, that building looks horrible, generate a 3D model of it, I can just load it straight in at one time if I wanted to. How do you deal with the scale then? Say that again, sorry? How do you deal with the scale? With the scale? I just imagine you guys need to have uh, some of this different version of the scale. Yeah, with the scale, that is a big issue because scaling or converting from automated survey to LiDAR or reference schemes to mm -hmm. longitude and latitude, there is errors within there, but scaling on buildings, it's going to be ha maybe a trial and error, but through the UI, you can scale a building, you can orientate it, mm -hmm. but that's on a pure model basis, not a singular. So, yeah, with a bit of work or user-defined work, it can be done procedurally. That's a different story. So, okay. thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Yep, please, thank you. Right, thank you very much for, for all <laughs> this, Mr. Martin. It's a wonderful presentation. And uh, we'll